So first, first off, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference. It's just been a wonderful experience, and I'm very grateful for being invited and giving a chance to, sp to speak. Um, also, I would like to uh, correct something I said last night at the banquet. Uh, last night I said I was the oldest student here of Roger and Sylvia. Turns out I'm really just the oldest looking <laughs> <laughs> student here of Roger and Sylvia. So thank you, Iowa, for correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's really an honor to be able to talk here and help celebrate the academic achievements in, of Roger and Sylvia and s to celebrate their impact in the field of commutative algebra, both professionally and personally, and I just can't thank you too enough for all you've done for, for me and for all of us in this room. So. Okay, so what I want to talk about is uh, not exactly modules of finite projective dimension, but something a little different, and I'll explain that in a second. So throughout the talk, R is going to be an associative ring. Um, it will become more specialized as the talk goes along. But for, for right now, let's just assume R is an associative ring. Uh, and M and N, let's assume these are non-zero R modules. And Oh, and again, later on, I'll probably start assuming that they're uh, finitely generated and things like that. So right now, they're just R modules. And P is going to always represent a, a uh, complex of projective R modules. which is bounded below, bounded in, uh, so I'll be assuming that the projectives are all zero for I less than, I less than zero. So bounded at zero. Okay. So let me start off with the definition. So this will be a two-part definition here. So first off, uh, we say that P is a projective resolution of this R module M if the homology of P is zero uh, for I different from zero and the zeroth homology of P is M. Okay. Um, okay, well, I'm not really going to talk about finite projective dimension. <laughs> I'm really going to talk about finite quasi-projective dimension. So sorry for one more use of the word quasi. So yeah. So what is, yeah, I really don't want to talk about projective resolutions, but quasi-projective resolutions. So what are these things? So all I change is the fact that uh, it's still a bounded below complex of projectives, but instead of no homology except at zero, I'm going to assume now that the homologies are just direct sums of copies of, of M, okay? So this is 
for all I. Can you read this, by the way? Is this too hard to read? This is direct, this is, I mean, a direct sum of copies of them. Yeah. Projective quasi resolution. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay. You know, oh, this is something that I. <laughs> this is something that I should. I'm glad, I'm glad. Okay, so you jogged my memory about something else I wanted to say. So I'm the oldest looking student of Roger. Uh, Mosin is his most recent student, and he's currently doing a, a postdoc with me. And so uh, back in June, just a month ago, Ryo Takahashi came to visit for a week, and basically everything I'm talking about here is what came out of that week. So this is brand new stuff, and we still haven't really fully agreed on what the name should be. We were calling these perfect resolutions and things like that, and so it may, I, I think that's maybe a good point. So I'll take that back to my co-authors and see what happens. <laughs> <coughs> oh, okay, and so, so I just want the homology of the complex to be direct sums of copies of the module, and I just want to make sure that the zero homology is non-zero. Okay. So there is some homology there. So this is what I'm going to call a quasi-projective resolution of M. Okay. And the second thing is you know, before I put the red thing there, just suppose I'm still talking about projective dimension. So the projective dimension of an R module M is just the infimum over all N such that P is a projective resolution of M. with uh, P sub I equaling zero for I greater than N. Okay, so it's, you look at all finite projective resolutions, take the shortest one, and that's the projective dimension. If, of course, if there is no finite projective resolution, then you just set that to be infinity. Okay, so I'm just gonna change this now. Uh, I'm going to put a Q in front. Or maybe I should put a Q after the P. <laughs> so now I want to define what the quasi-projective dimension is. It's uh, the same thing, except I just now let P be a quasi-projective resolution of M. So I'm just taking the shortest quasi-projective resolution of M. That's the quasi-projective dimension. Okay, so, so the goal of this talk then is uh, is now just to study these modules. Okay, so the goal is to study modules with finite quasi-projective dimension. So FQPD, quasi, finite quasi-projective dimension. Okay. So probably the first thing I should tell you is some, some examples, okay? So let's look at some examples. Okay, well, obviously, the quasi-projective dimension of any module is less than or equal to the projective dimension, okay? Right, because if you had a finite projective resolution, well, that's a finite quasi-projective resolution. There might be a shorter one, but at least you know uh, that it's finite. So, so any module of finite projective dimension has finite quasi-projective dimension. Okay. Second thing. P 
periodic modules. have finite quasi-projective dimension. So what do I mean by periodic module? I just mean a module with a periodic projective resolution. Right, if, you, if you're a module with a periodic projective resolution, you just chop the, yeah. you just chop the complex where, it, where the periodicity kicks in and the kernel of, you know, the end is gonna be the module again, the M again, so. So periodic modules have finite quasi-projective dimension. Um, another example. So if the ring is local, so if RMK is local, then the quasi-projective dimension of the residue field is finite. So the residue field, the local ring, is, has finite quasi-projective dimension. Why? Well, you just take the Kazuo complex on generators of the maximal ideal. You know that that's killed by the maximal ideal, so each homology is just copies of K. Excuse me? Yes, Netherian. Yeah, no, for me, local means Netherian. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, more generally, if you take any ideal. Take the Kazool complex on the generators of that ideal. Anytime the, the, the homologies of the Kazool complex are free R mod I modules, then R mod I is, has finite quasi-projective dimension for the same reason. So more generally, if these are isomorphic to direct sum copies of R mod I, then the quasi-projective dimension of R mod I is finite. Okay, so Mosin and I like to say ideals with free Kazool homology, these are examples. So that, of course, the residue field is just a special case of this. Okay. But this, this can happen, you know, it happens a lot. a lot, whatever a lot means. Okay, uh, I guess I should call this three prime, stick with my notes. So that's three prime, and then four, and another example. If R is the quotient of a regular local ring, Q, by an ideal generated by a regular sequence, okay, so, in this case, every R module has finite quasi, -proje finite quasi projective dimension. Finite quasi projective dimension. Okay. Uh, Oh, so why is this? Well, you can just take a resolution of any module M over Q, right? And then tensor that down with R. That's what you're really doing then is computing a tor, but you could have computed the tor by taking a resolution of R and then tensoring it with M. But what is a resolution of R? It's just the Kazool complex. And so all the maps in the Kazool complex are <coughs> elements in the regular sequence, but those annihilate M, right? So when you tensor with M, you just get copies of M in the homology. So every module over such a ring has finite quasi-projective dimension. So in particular, for four prime,
every module over a complete, complete intersection has quasi, finite quasi projective dimension. Over a complete, complete intersection. Finite quasi projective dimension. Okay. So, yeah, these things exist. They're kind of a common generalization of a, of a lot of different things. Um, I just like to write complete, complete intersection. <laughs> okay. <coughs> um, okay, so. There's the examples, and I just want to make a note at this point that all the results I'm about to write down are due to myself and the co-authors, okay? Okay. So, I think I guess the first result I'll write down is well kind of a converse to four prime here. So a local ring RMK is a complete intersection. If and only if every R hat module has a finite quasi projective dimension. So it's, we actually get the converse of this. Uh, it's a very nice result, and it, we didn't hardly do anything. It was Josh Politz. Uh, your, your no. <laughs> Yeah, that the completion is the quotient of a regular ring light, regular sequence. <coughs> yeah, so this uses a, pr a pretty deep result of Josh Politz, from, who's a recent graduate from Nebraska. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say more about that later, but since you brought it up, this is a really weird situation where, you know, you have really, homo you have really strange homological bedfellows. <laughs> I mean, the residue field is in the same class as R, homologically, right? They both have finite quasi-protected dimension. Um, and that's contrary to what we usually see. Yeah, usually the residue field is the bad guy, but in this case, he's a good guy. So, <coughs> okay, so maybe I'll entitle this preservers. So here I'll list several operations that preserve quasi-projective dimension, finite quasi-projective dimension. So first, um, the quasi-projective dimension of a direct sum is less than or equal to the sum of the quasi-projective dimensions. So if you have two modules of finite quasi-projective Finite quasi projective dimension, their direct sum has finite quasi projective dimension. No, it's actually sort of a subtle proof. I mean, because you have, I mean, M is going to have a P where the homology of P are direct sums of copies of M, and N has another thing, say Q, 
where the with direct sums of copies have been, but they can have num different numbers of copies in each spot, you know, so the numbers of copies don't have to agree. So you have to play a little game. You have to shift and take direct sums of them and stuff. So. <coughs> Second one, given a uh, short exact sequence, say 0 to n to p to m to 0, with p projective, <coughs> oops, I should call this q, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, with q projective, the quasi-projective dimension of n is less than or equal to the quasi-projective dimension of m. Okay. So, in particular, if a module has quasi finite quasi-projective dimension, all of its syzygies also have finite quasi-projective dimension. So this property is preserved under syzygies. Uh, three, if an element in the ring X is M-regular, then the quasi-projective dimension of M mod XM is less than or equal to quasi-projective dimension of m plus 1. Okay? So, if, you, if m has finite quasi-projective dimension, you can factor out an, a regular sequence, and then that module also has finite quasi-projective dimension. Four, if s is a multiplicatively closed set, then the quasi-projective dimension of S inverse R, S inverse M, is less than or equal to the quasi-projective dimension of M over R. Okay, and that's obvious because localization is a f flat, flat functor, so it doesn't change the homology of your quasi-projective resolution. And the same thing for completion. So if, if R happened to be local, then the quasi-projective dimension of M, over, M hat over R hat is less than or equal to the quasi-projective dimension of R over M. Uh, this one, nothing. This one, nothing. This one, I don't think anything. Uh, I suppose four, you want R to be commutative. And then the last one, commutative local. Yeah. Oh, you mean even hmm? Okay, so there's some properties that preserve the uh, that preserve the property. Uh, let me talk now about some other results. So um, so from now on, Let's assume that R is commutative. And modules are finitely generated. Okay. So we have a lower bound on the quasi-projective dimension. 
it's probably no surprise. So I'll call this a proposition, I guess. This is what we call it in the paper. Um, the quasi-projected dimension of an R module M is at least the soup of the heights of the minimal primes of the module. And, of course, that bound can be achieved, and you take R itself <laughs> um, that has finite quasi-projective dimension. Um, okay, so I guess that's all I wanted to say. For, for a commutative now, let me just specialize farther to local. So... Uh, so if anybody read the abstract for this talk, well, it doesn't matter, I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, it turns out that, that these modules, I mean, it's kind of no surprise because uh, as we saw, any module over a, you know, a quotient of a regular ring by regular sequence, you know, so these are like modules over a complete intersection, for example, um, these quasi-projective dimension, you know, those are finite quasi-projective dimensions. So it turns out that that modules that have quasi finite quasi-projective dimension behave a lot like modules over a complete intersection. So that's what the next series of results are going to say. Okay. There's one more thing I wanted to say before that. <laughs> okay. <coughs> well, it's probably no surprise also that we get a now slender books bomb formula for s for modules. So let me just state that. So here's the theorem. So let's say the uh, quasi-projective dimension of, of M is L and it's is finite. Then we have the following equality. We have L minus the soup of P equals the depth of R minus the depth of M. And this is where, here I'm assuming this P is a shortest quasi-projective resolution. Quasi-projective resolution. Okay. So, uh, you can see this is kind of a generalization of the Auslander Buchsbaum formula because if you were a module of finite projective of finite projective dimension, then you have a finite projective resolution, right? And what's the soup? I mean, so maybe not everybody knows this, but okay, when I say soup of a complex, I mean this, the last the the last non-zero homology, okay. So what's the soup of a projective resolution? It's just zero, right? Because it only has homology in degree zero. So if it had finite projective dimension, the soup is just zero, then you just have the projective dimension equals the depth of R minus the depth of M. That's the Auslander Buchsbaum formula. Um, it's interesting, too, because this also recovers the depth sensitivity of the Kazool complex because, you know, if, if your module is R mod I for I generated by... Or for any ideal, then you know this is you know the soup, the last non-zero homology tells you the depth, right? So okay, <coughs> all right.
So I should point out that the proof of this, of the Al Slender Buxbaum form formula uses uh, what I'll call a lemma. This is kind of an important consequence that if uh, the quasi-projective dimension of the module is finite, then the depth of M has to be less than or equal to the depth of the ring. Okay. So then the depth of M is less than or equal to the depth of R. Okay. Okay. So now, let me get to the uh, stuff I was saying before. So I want to talk about vanishing of extentor, okay? Um, I want to mention that there were several talks, Graham's and Nick's in particular, that focused on the impact that Roger had in the field of direct sum decompositions. But another topic that he had major impact in commutative algebra was on the study of vanishing tor and properties of the tensor product, in particular torsion and tensor products. And that was an investigation that was begun by Auslander back in the 60s. And Roger, together with Craig Hunicke, kind of revived the topic in the 90s, and it's been a very influential, uh, um, their, their work has been very influential, and a lot of people have since generalized, and I mean, they did, a, they studied things originally over hypersurfaces, and there's been a lot of work about extending their results and things to complete intersections. And so, I wouldn't be talking about this if it weren't for Roger. <laughs> okay. So let me just state the theorem here. So we're going to assume M and N are R modules. Uh, and I want to assume that the quasi projected dimension of M is finite. Let me say L. So two things. So let's take a positive integer n. Then if tor i r m n is zero for all i between n and n plus l. So if you have n plus, if you, sorry, if you have L plus one consecutive vanishings of tor starting at n, then it turns out that all the tors have to vanish beyond n, okay. So, let's say that. This is what's called rigidity of Tor. It's well known to, the, to those of us that this is well known to happen for modules over a complete intersection, but more generally it holds for these modules of finite quasi-projective dimension. Okay. Second thing is if Tor I R M N is zero for all, s all large i, then actually the tors had to start being zero at the depth of r minus the depth of m. So these are two forms of rigidity of Tor. Um, so 
So we have another theorem, which I won't write. I'll just say do, it's exactly the same theorem except x instead of tor. So you get exactly the same statement replacing x dem n by, replacing tor mn by x dem n. Okay. So the rigidity of x. Yes. Uh, I guess the first person to do this was probably Murti, right? Um, uh, but then there's, he did it for Tor, but he was assuming that R was a complete intersection. Now it's been generalized to modules of finite complete intersection dimension and all kinds of modules of reducible complexity, blah, blah, blah. There's all kinds of variations on these results, but yeah. Okay. Um, so we have rigidity of X and Tor, just like we do for modules over complete intersection. Here's another uh, indication that these modules behave like modules over a complete intersection. So this is an application to the Auslander Wrighton conjecture. Let me just state it as a theorem. So let's suppose M has finite quasi-projective dimension. Then two things I'll say. If X I R M M, so the Alcindor Wright conjecture uh, deals with modules with so-called no self-extensions, so the vanishing of X to M with its against itself. So if this is zero for I between the range of two and um, L plus one, then it turns out that the projective dimension, the pro actual projective dimension of M has to be less than or equal to one. And if the vanishing starts at one to L plus one, then M has, M has to be projective. Okay. So. It's the quasi-projective dimension. And it's projective. I guess it's free. I'm assuming R is local at this point. Yeah. No. No. Just X to MM. Yeah, it's a good point. The Auslander Wrighton conjecture says that if you have all ze you know, zero x of m against m directs m r, then m must be projective. But we don't even need that other condition. <coughs> but this is what happens for complete intersections, too. But okay, so one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, Another influential, uh, well, I guess it's a formula due to, well, first Auslander and then uh, Roger and Craig is what's called the depth formula. So I'll just state it as a theorem. So suppose M and N are R modules with uh, the quasi-projective dimension of M finite. Then if you have the vanishing of 
these tours, all positive tours, then it turns out that the depth of M plus the depth of N equals the depth of R plus the depth of the tensor product, N tensor N. You can barely read there. Okay. Uh, well, I'm out of time, but I just uh, wanted to mention some ongoing questions. Probably the biggest one that we're grappling with at the moment is the question of finitistic quasi-projective dimension. So, you know, this, this is not as cut and dried as it is for projective dimension. I mean, so we all know that the dimension of the ring bounds the projective dimension, but that's not the case for quasi-projective dimension. So is there a bound? We don't know that yet. Um, and then also discovering other interesting classes of modules of, of finite quasi-projective dimension. That's something we're investigating. Well, I'll stop here. Yeah. No. Well, sort of. I, I, there was one result I didn't write down. And so if you think of a ring as three distinguished modules, potentially, right? The ring, the residue field, and the canonical module, so we can prove that if the canonical module, well, the canonical module has finite quasi-projective dimension if and only if the ring is Gorenstein. So this is, Mm. Ooh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, for the proof we currently have, we need all of them, yeah. Yeah, this is not quite as sharp as what you get over a complete intersection. And if over a complete intersection, if, if a single even x vanishes, then m has to be projective. So. But this is the best we can do so far. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I didn't really look at it before. Uh, yeah, so that would just say that, that your, your shortest quasi-projective resolution had homology in the last degree. Yeah, so this will have to be zero as well. So the soup of P is equal to the length of P. Length of P, yeah. Okay, so let's thank you.